Hello, a very warm good morning to all of you and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. Welcome to today's The Hindu Newspaper Analysis, where we shall be taking a look at the important articles which have appeared in today's The Hindu Newspaper, that is the Delhi edition. So, the topics that we are going to discuss today can be listed in the kind of a descriptive and a prelims perspective overall. So, first of all, we shall be taking a look at detailed analysis of three of the major topics, that is responsibilities and the complexity of climate leadership, which has appeared in page 8, a part of the editorial section, and is relevant for your GS paper 3, in terms of the climate actions, the issues faced by the developing countries in general. Then, Bipar Joy, that is a cyclone that we have been hearing a lot about. And I think by this time, we all know where Bipar Joy has made a landfall, what are the various different types of features associated. So we are going to have a trend analysis that it is a part of a new trend in Indian cyclones, the cyclones which have been developing in the northern Indian Ocean, be it the Arabian Sea or the Bay of Bengal, they have been indicating a slight variation. The intensity has been growing stronger. So that is something that we are going to analyze. And then China's developmental security approach, whereby China is interlinking the portion of developmental requirements and the requirement of the national security that is being married together. And as a result of that, it is leading to complex geopolitical scenarios where you will come across situations where many different companies and industries are being put sanctions on. So that is something that we are going to discuss. What is the opportunity and role that it has got to play when we talk about India? Then certain aspects relevant for your prelims, that is Gita Press has been awarded or conferred with the Gandhi Peace Prize. So we are going to discuss what this Gandhi Peace Prize is, which is the jury or what is the jury consisted of who basically nominates any entity or organization or individual to be rewarded as the Gandhi Peace Prize. That is going to be relevant for our prelims. And then the net direct tax collection has risen by a whopping 11.2%. And that again, here we shall be analyzing the direct tax and the indirect tax component very briefly again for the prelims. And at the end of it, we shall be discussing the two subjective questions which can be framed from the topic and we shall try to analyze what kind of answers and how we can recreate answers for that. And after the session, I would suggest to you kindly go to the Telegram channel where you will find the objective questions which have been uploaded and that shall be your analysis or a kind of a test about how much you have understood in this portion of news analysis. So starting with the first article of the day and that is the article which has appeared in the portion of the editorial page and this has been co-penned or jointly written by Sheikh Hasina, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh and Muhammad Nasheed, the ex-president of Maldives. Now this is something which has appeared in page 8 relevant for your GS paper 3. Now, this is responsibility and the complexities of climate leadership. Now, this talks about the climate leadership or the leadership associated with various different climate forums and how it has run into a lot of controversy. So basically, one of the most flag bearing organizations when it comes to climate change and combating climate change is actually UNFCCC that is United Nation Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that is UNFCCC. Okay, so this convention basically which was formed after the Rio conference in 1992 has been one of the front running organizations and conventions which talks about the aspects of climate change and also how to tackle climate change. It is a result of this convention that the world has actually arrived on the very important Kyoto Protocol as well as the Paris Agreement. Both are a part of this particular convention and have been signed as a result of 
the interactions and dialogues initiated by this convention. Now, why I am talking about this particular convention in particular is that as per the norms of this convention, all the member nations or the parties, they meet once every year in what is referred to as conference of parties. That COP meeting is held every year. Last year, COP 27, that is the 27th meeting of the conference of parties, that was held in Egypt. And it is here where the loss and damage funds, etc., they were finalized. Now, what is that loss and damage fund? That is basically if let's suppose any country, suppose India, suppose Bangladesh. Now, due to climate change, we are experiencing significant departure from normal weather conditions. We are experiencing extraordinary amount of rainfall happening in a short duration, leading to flash floods, landslides and lot of destruction associated with that. Now that destruction which has been caused because of climate change, you need some amount of reparation, some amount of rehabilitation for the people who have lost their properties, their loved ones, etc. So that funding which is required, that has been put under the loss and damage fund. So this was the major outcome of the COP27 which was held in 2022. This year, that is in 2023, COP28 is being held and will be held rather in UAE. And this is where all the controversy has been erupting. So basically, as UAE will be the president of that conference of parties 28 to be held in 2023, the person heading that presidentship shall be Sultan Al Jabbar, the minister of UAE, that is Sultan Al Jabbar. Now, this is the name due to which all the controversy is erupting around because as an individual, he is also the chairman of ADNOC, that is Abu Dhabi National Oil Corporation, a fossil fuel producing company. And because he is the chairman of ADNOC, so that is why the world sees a kind of a hypocrisy involved. That how can an individual who is heading that oil company, how can that individual be made the president or the person in charge of the conference of parties for climate change? So European Parliament, many of the members of the American legislature and the American Parliament, they have already started submitting their protests and written protests overall, basically revolting against the president and the presidentship held by UAE. And that is where the entire world is getting divided into whether this person should be allowed to hold the presidentship or there should be a change in the presidentship. That is where, that is the backdrop in which this article has been penned down by the head of the government of Bangladesh as well as the ex-president of Maldives. Now, because these are the two countries which are very, very vulnerable to climate change. So that is why this article talks about the fact that, look, while the entire world can afford to get divided on these petty issues, whether someone can be made a president or should be made a president or not. But when it comes to climate vulnerable countries, those climate vulnerable countries, we cannot afford to waste any amount of time in these discussions. We need to get our house in order when it comes to arrangement of finances, availability of technology and the other requirements of these countries as well. Now, here, these countries, they have also set up what is referred to as the Climate Vulnerable Forum. That Climate Vulnerable Forum, this was established way back in 2009. That is the Climate Vulnerability Forum. It was established in 2009 under the initiative of Maldives. And that was before the conference of parties of UNFCCC which was supposed to be held in Copenhagen, Denmark that year. So before that, few of the countries 
the vulnerable countries, that is the island nations, the low-lying regions of the world, which will be impacted by effects such as the rise in sea level water, such as greater occurrence of tropical cyclones, which is induced due to climate change. So these countries, they came together. Overall, they end up representing a total population of close to around 1.5 billion and having a combined GDP value of close to around 2.4 trillion US dollars. So it is a significantly important grouping, so to say. And there, this grouping has been working to raise awareness amongst the various different members of the world in order to fight that climate change. And how the impact or the basic effect of climate change is very disproportionate. If you think about the impact of climate change, it is not uniform. It is not as if all the rich nations, the poor nations will have the equivalent impact. No. The richer nations, the technologically advanced nations, they have better predictability method. Right? They are able to predict the changes in the climatic conditions much before. They have a greater capacity to handle the impacts of climate change. Whereas the poorer nations, they are the ones which suffer the wrath of climate change. And that is where lots and lots of losses and damages are happening. We can take the example of the neighboring country of Pakistan. Last year, it suffered from one of the most devastating floods to have hit the South Asian region. Almost one third of the arable land of the country was submerged due to the floods, leading to a kind of an economic crisis, which further surmounted the problems that the country is facing. Now, these kinds of issues are on the rise. Look at the intensity of the cyclone Bipper Joy as well. That is much more intense than the normal cyclones that you observe occurring in that area. So what does that tell you? That the impact of climate change is coming to the forefront. And in these times, we cannot have the discussion of who shall be the president or not. Now, this is something which is relevant for your prelims. That is the Climate Vulnerability Forum. Okay, now, other than that, this article also points about the fact that, look, even though this individual is the chairperson of Adnoc, that is an oil company, this journey or this transition to fight climate change should not or will never happen if you divide the world into the people who use renewable energy and the ones who use fossil fuels. Eventually, this journey towards climate change and how to combat it will be fought by all of the individuals. So oil companies, they themselves are in a phase of reformation where they are trying to focus upon greener energy. And that is where all the various commitments that even UAE has made, if you will analyze that, even there, UAE is actively trying to combat the aspect of climate change. For example, one of the initiatives that for which UAE can be significantly lauded is the Mangrove Alliance for Climate. Mangrove Alliance for Climate. Now this is an initiative launched by UAE in COP27, that is Conference of Parties 27 Egypt, which was held at Sharm El Sheikh. And this is basically co-initiated by Indonesia and UAE to increase the mangrove cover of the world because of the benefits that it has. India is also a part of this mangrove alliance for climate, by the way. So here we have to understand that each and every member in the committee of nations have their own role to play. Now, let us first of all analyze very briefly, what are the issues in general faced by the developing nations when it comes to these climate forums, when it comes to combating climate change. So here, the basic is the lack of available funds. And there is no two ways about it. Ever since 1992, since the Rio Declaration came into existence and the various conventions have come into practice, there has always been a lot of promise made by the developing nation, developed nations rather, and the developing and the underdeveloped nations, they have not gotten the required benefit. You have to understand why is it that there is no available funds in general? Because whenever we talk about fighting climate change or combating climate change and the impacts of it, the entire principle works upon the basic aspect of CBDR. That is common but differentiated responsibility. 
Now what is this CBDR? Differentiated responsibility. So this basically in a nutshell refers to the fact that look, even though everyone has got a responsibility which we share for preserving the planet, conserving the climatic conditions across the planet and so on, you have to understand that it is the developed nations as of today, that is the American nations, that is the European nations, the developed nations of today who have emitted significant amount of pollutants into the atmosphere in the past four to five decades, the impact of which we are facing now, right? So because they have developed on the backdrop of those emissions and the pollution, that is something that the world is suffering from. So this principle talks about the fact that the developed nations have got a greater share of responsibility to combat climate change. And this is ideal or apt in terms of seeking funds to fight that aspect of climate change. So where the funds will come from? Ideally, developed nations. So this is what the developing and the underdeveloped nations of the world, they seek for. But when it comes to the developed nations, they always will find some or the other excuse whereby they will point the finger at, let's say, China or India and so on. And that is why the funds are never released. In fact, the loss and damage fund, which was initiated in COP27 in Egypt, there has not been a single step move forward in that particular regard in accumulating money for that fund. So what we have as of now in terms of fighting climate crisis is a lot of various different empty accounts which are supposed to serve the poorer nations and all the poorer nations, the island nations, the Pacific nations, etc. They are already facing the brunt of climate change and they are facing grievances due to this. But also there is a significant lack of technology. Let's suppose you talk about a country like India or Bangladesh who emit a lot of uh, emissions or pollutants and contaminants into the air because of, let's say, burning of fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is burned for generation of electricity. Fossil fuel is burned for transportation purposes also. But then, in order to stop that, in order to bring that to an end, what do we need? We need better technology for electric vehicles, for greener hydrogen and so on and we don't have that technology if you can think about it that countries like India if we have not mastered that technology yet you can think about the plight of countries like Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan and so on so that is why there the availability of technology is also a major pinch point where the developed nations, they are neither giving the money nor are they giving the available technology and they are expecting at the end of it that the developing nations or underdeveloped nations, they should somehow curb the level of emissions, which is impossible. No country will take the developmental requirements of their citizens at the second hand basis. Everybody will put priority to that. And this is what this article also talks about it, that be it Bangladesh, be it Maldives, be it India, any country they will never take any action on climate if the interest of the citizens in the near term future, they are damaged. None of these actions will be taken. That is why overall across the globe, you have, when you read the emissions gap report, when you read the, about the adaptation gap report, there's a lot of gap in what is committed by the various countries and what is being achieved. Then unsustainable level of debt. Many of these smaller nations, they have a mounting level of debt, whereby even the servicing of that debt is becoming hugely impossible. Now, a country like UAE, through the various different multilateral lending organizations and through the various different sovereign debt bonds that it has, it seeks to restructure the available economic pendency that these countries are indicating and it seeks to provide them a bit of relief. So that is also another reason why many of the smaller nations, they are looking forward to the presidentship of UAE. And loss and damages, as I told you, nothing concrete has been developed upon it after the last conference of parties and all the countries are suffering damages worth billions of dollars, rather hundreds of billions of dollars due to climate change. So the loss is immense, the recuperation is not significant. And then eventually everyone is tired of the empty promises handled out 
during these conventional meetings and by particularly the developed nations. So there's a general grievance in existence against the developed nations. That is what this article talks about and it talks about the importance of gaining a kind of a unified approach to deal with climate change where the world is not divided by the basis of whether someone uses fossil fuels or whether someone does not use it because eventually due to climate change everyone will be impacted. So in this article what is it that we have studied? Basically we have looked at the what is conference of parties, we have looked at UNFCCC, we have also looked at the aspect of climate vulnerability forum. India is still now, India is not a member. Okay, till now, India is not a member. Who initiated the CVF? That is also something that we have talked about. Then, the issues of developing nations. Now, if we know the issues, we can also come up with solutions. You can have more open multilateral organizations which transparently deal with the aspect of funding that if any country has not given the required funding that it had promised there should be repercussions or there should be ramifications associated with that so more open and transparent global transaction that we have better it will be in the long run for the climatic aspect okay now after this we move on to the second topic and before that uh, what uh, what about carbon credit so carbon credit is a methodology to combat climate change initiated during the Kyoto Protocol you have various different methodologies by which you can transfer carbon credit but then carbon credit understand will never give you that substantial amount of fund required to combat the issues of let's say the losses the damages and the newer technologies that you need to adapt okay and uh, Ashu Sharma, despite overwhelming scientific evidence and public pressure, politicians in some countries are still reluctant to take decisive action on climate change. Why? Because of local vote bank politics in many of the cases. For example, the ideal case in point is that of Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump, when he was elected as a president, now large section of the Republican electoral vote base, they believe that climate change is a kind of a conspiracy theory. I'm talking about large sections of the population. So the first action that Donald Trump did was he ensured that US exits the Paris Agreement, which obviously was reverted when Joe Biden came in. But then again, this is a kind of a popularity politics which plays along across all the various different nations. Okay. And fossil fuel basically is referred to crude oil, natural gas, etc. All those types of energy minerals which are created due to fossilization, that is fossil fuel. Now, then we come across to the second article that is Bipper Joy, part of a new trend in Indian cyclones. Now, Bipper Joy, which has hit the eastern coastline or western coastline of India and particularly the region around Gujarat, that cyclone intensified quite significantly before making landfall and it was categorized into a very severe cyclonic storm. Now overall the cyclonic formation has been a consistent factor both in the region of Bay of Bengal as well as the region of Arabian Sea. On an average however if you consider both these water bodies the amount or the frequency of cyclones is much more prominent much more visible in the case of Bay of Bengal, that is where more frequency of cyclones occur because of various different reasons. You have the factor of Bay of Bengal heats up very quickly, heats up very quickly. Then after that, low pressure systems. also travel travel from south china sea right normal conditions of walker circulation 
walker cell creates a low pressure over Bay of Bengal. You have more amount of fresh water which is emptied into the region of Bay of Bengal, right? More river discharge into Bay of Bengal. So you have various different factors which are and many other factors which are responsible for observing greater frequency of tropical cyclones in the region of Bay of Bengal. That has been the case for a long period of time. Now here there has been certain trends which have been analyzed in the article that how the occurrence of cyclones in these areas how they have been indicating a marked shift. For example, if we analyze these trends, the number of cyclonic disturbances both in the Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, the frequency of them has been rising. And this is the chart which indicates that. That look, observe how that after the lows which were hit in mid 90s, the number of these cyclonic disturbances, they are on the rise. Now why they are rising again? Why is it that the number of events of these are increasing? First of all, global warming. And due to global warming, what do we have? We have rising sea surface temperature. Rising sea surface temperature. Now when you have rising sea surface temperature, intense low pressure systems are formed. are formed and these intense low pressure systems lead to cyclones. Now here understand that the global warming which is happening, the global temperature rise which is happening that is inducing more cyclones but there is another interesting trend which has been observed and that trend is that in the region of Bay of Bengal still in comparison to the last century there has been a decline in the number of cyclonic events whereas there has been a subsequent increase in the number of cyclonic events observed in the region of Arabian Sea. Still, you will find that Arabian Sea has got lesser cyclones as compared to Bay of Bengal on an average. But the numbers, the trend is increasing. And why is that? Why is it that we have nowadays we have started observing more cyclones in the region of Arabian Sea? Again, because of increased heating. Earlier, the Arabian Sea temperature used to range around 24 to 25 degrees Celsius. It would increase at max to around 27, 28. So you would have one of cyclonic disturbances which could be erupted one every year or maybe a couple of them every two years and so on. But for the last three to four years, ever since cyclone Tote was observed in, and significant analysis was done, it was found out that regions of Arabian Sea, they are heating up to a temperature range of as much as 32 to 33 degrees Celsius, which is very, very high. Ideally, if the sea surface temperature is higher than 27 degrees Celsius, that brings about a condition adequate for formation of tropical cyclone. So if the temperature conditions are as high as 33, you can imagine the formation of these cyclones also. Now what it also brings into the picture, if you have a cyclone formed in the region of Arabian Sea, let's suppose we consider the peninsula, and here you have a cyclonic formation which is observed. Now this would attract winds from all directions in general. Okay. This would attract winds from here also. Here also. Okay. Now when the winds are already moving towards a low pressure, this becomes, this portion that is the Bay of Bengal, that becomes comparatively a comparative high pressure. So that is why where you have a comparative high pressure in those conditions a cyclonic disturbance doesn't develop very quickly. So because the Arabian Sea has been witnessing larger amount of these cyclones that is why 
in bay of bengal in general the number of cyclones occurring is comparatively lesser but please understand understand the difference still bay of bengal experiences greater occurrence of cyclones it is just the proportion which is changing because of increased rainfall happening across the western coastline and the western seaboard however sometimes it still happens that after one cyclone has made a landfall after that let's say bay of bengal heat has heat level has raised significantly it can form another cyclone after that but its impact will be slightly reduced its intensity will be slightly reduced so this is another trend that you have to note and this is again a simple resultant of the rising sea surface temperature and the rising sea surface temperature also brings about what is referred to as the thermal expansion of water just like any state of matter water also tends to expand under heat and when water expands under heat the expanded portion will get heated quite significantly leading to greater occurrences another trend which has been observed is the intensity now the intensity of the cyclonic storms that has been increasing for the past 4 to 5 years where if you will observe now here you have various different depictions and demarcations in the chart you have d representing the depression that is the low pressure the cyclonic storm is represented by cs and severe cyclonic storm is represented by scs so depression is of least intensity it will only be a circulating section of wind so lesser wind speed roughly around 80 to 100 kilometers that will be the wind speed severe cyclonic storms wind speed approaches close to around 200 km per hour so observe the trend here you will observe that since around 99 to 2003 the proportion of severe cyclonic storm that has continued or demarcated an increase ever since 2004 onwards so it was 16% earlier then it increased to 23 then 26 and now it has increased to a whopping 32% that means what greater amount of these severe cyclonic storms are getting created and also amongst the severe cyclonic storms created you have greater probability of the severe cyclonic storms getting formed in the region of arabian sea in fact it was found out that one in every three cyclone which develops in arabian sea develops into very severe category and that is a ample representation of how the temperature of arabian sea has been rising now here why is this article relevant because see upsc is never going to ask you a kind of a question that what was bipper joy that kind of simplistic question you cannot expect uh, up to a upsc level upsc if there has been bipper joy which has occurred which has been in lot of media headlines and news limelight in general so you'll find upsc asking you the larger trend a trend analysis that how is it that the northern indian ocean is changing the atmospheric circulation in the northern indian ocean what are the changes experienced due to climate change so that analysis needs to be depicted that what is the change happening in arabian sea bay of bengal earlier what was the situation now what is the situation okay so here you will observe this bipper joy as you can see this is again in the category of severe cyclone okay now after this we move on to the next topic now um a couple of questions i'll take uh sindhu shona what will be the implication of the thermal expansion of water so thermal expansion of water when it happens see understand the entire oceanic water will not expand it is only the topmost portion which will experience an expansion so as a result of that that topmost portion will distinguish itself when it comes to heating and that is why there is a concentrated and a quicker heating can we say that bipper joy is impact of el nino not particularly so el nino events they have a positive correlation ship with more cyclones in arabian sea but here in this case el nino has not completely developed till now the other aspects which will impact the formation of cyclones in the arabian sea is for example when you have positive indian ocean dipole 
uh, that is the condition when you will have cyclones in Arabian Sea, when you have the convective phase of Mad and Julian oscillation. So all these factors are responsible, but the major factor, the basic factor is what? It is the heating of the sea surface. El Nino we have basically discussed in detail in the big news, kindly refer to that. Okay. And uh, who gave the name of these type of cyclones? So it is formed by a committee of nations and these nations have already submitted the names. For Northern Indian Ocean, you have 13 nations and all of them have submitted 13 names. So already we know that the next cyclone which will occur in the Northern Indian Ocean, it will be named as Tej, the name which has been submitted by India. This Biparjoy was submitted by Bangladesh. So like that you have the predecided naming. Okay. High acidification is not a major reason, but high acidification overall leads to warming of atmosphere. It is not a major reason for warming of the uh, water body in general. Is there any impact of ITCZ, Vivek? Yes, ITCZ has got a role to play in terms of the movement of that entire cyclonic disturbance. The reason why the cyclonic disturbance traveled and hit Gujarat was because the ITCZ had reached Gujarat earlier itself. So the wind systems were pushing already towards the ITCZ. Okay. Now, then we come across to the ne next article relevant for your portion of international relations and that is China's developmental security approach. Now this article basically in a nutshell talks about the interrelation between development and security. Whereby, in the recent past, there have been various different events and various different incidents whereby the companies which have been listed in or which have been operating in China, the US based companies, they are experiencing a lot of difficulties in functionality because a lot of these offices are consistently raided and there are a lot of materials which are seized and a lot of these industries are facing closure where they are operating in China, in Beijing and at other places in China as well. And this is basically a kind of a tit for tat approach where initially last year, if you recall, Last year, there was a wave and a series of incidents whereby United States that started putting sanctions on many of these Chinese companies with a single point agenda that many of these Chinese organizations and companies, they are accessing the high tech security softwares and high tech technology of United States and using that for the militarization of the armed forces in China. Development of these critical technologies, please understand, is a very important part of the ever-growing arms race. The new age arms race is not about who develops more number of tanks, who develops more number of aircrafts, who has more number of people in the armed forces and so on. No. The modern day warfare is fought on the basis of technology. And technological advances and especially the critical technologies, for example, blockchain, AI, stealth tech, etc. There has been a lot of espionage and counter espionage going on between China and United States for some time now. So while United States that prevents access to technology for many of the Chinese companies, the Chinese, they retaliate with that. And the Chinese now have conducted raids across various different even consultancy firms. Consultancy firms which facilitate trade between these countries, even they are at the receiving end of these kinds of raids which are happening. Now, while all this is happening, one basic thing you have to keep in mind, a complete decoupling of China and United States is impossible. It is not possible in the near term future that China will have no contact with United States. Because together, these two countries have a trade around 700 US billion dollars, right? So that is the total trade happening. So complete decoupling is out of the picture. So what is this all about? So basically it is economics of retaliation overall, sanctioning of Chinese companies in the US, especially the chip manufacturer, chip manufacturing, chip as in the semiconductors. Semiconductor industry 
is at a very nascent stage in many of the countries of the world. India is also trying to have much more investment in the semiconductor industry because semiconductors are in use everywhere. Right? From the electronic devices that we use to the complex automobiles to even the rockets, semiconductors are in use everywhere. And China is the major supply center for semiconductors in the world. And the world has been dependent on China unlike ever before. Now, there was this realization which dawned upon for the rest of the world during the time of the COVID pandemic that not only has China gathered a large market space for semiconductor manufacturing at the same time, slowly and steadily it is gathering the aspects of espionage, it is spying on the other nations by the semiconductor chips that it manufactures and the electronic devices that it makes. So the various different countries, they rushed in to put a ban on Chinese companies in critical areas. For example, you would have observed India also passed a regulation banning the Chinese companies from participating in 5G auction trade. Why? Because it is a sensitive technology where India doesn't want other companies, especially from China, spying or, or using this as a platform to spy on Indian data pointers and Indian data sources. So a fear is similarly very high in United States. Because as of now, United States sees only one true competitor across the global scenario, and that is China. Then there's divergence between the business side of the United States and the US administration. And that dichotomy, that difference in opinion is very apparent. While on the face of it, you will observe that the US administration, the Chinese government, they will always consistently, they will keep on arguing and bickering against each other, issuing statements against each other. On the other hand, you will find that majority of the US business leaders, they make frequent trips to China for more investment. Recently, you would have come across Elon Musk having a trip to China and having his intentions clear of the next major manufacturing hub of the electric vehicles being opened up in China. So while the industry leaders of United States, they see China as an opportune market, whereas the US administration looks at it as a kind of a security perspective. Because consider anything else, China till today is one of the largest markets available in terms of demand. The demand is very high of various different goods. So that very large Chinese market is very difficult to ignore for any manufacturer. Any industrialist who wants to make a sizable profit and sizable turnover, they can never ignore the Chinese market, which is very, very large. And that is bringing divergences in the uh, public policy also, due to which certain companies are facing sanctions. Certain of them, they are flouting those sanctions, transshipping the materials through other countries, and still the war on critical technology rages on. And this has happened because of the interrelation between development and security. Now observe the dichotomy here. India and China, they have an active border dispute. But observe that whenever China has used any international platform to address these issues, what is the narrative that China puts forward? that India should look at development and the border disputes, they are a security concern that will be taken care of in due course of time. But right now, we need to focus on development and trade. Now, while India is expected to do that, China itself does not do that. China itself has very conveniently mixed the aspect of development and security. And that is damaging to the entire world, how we'll talk about it. And as a result of that, Slowly and steadily, the domestic norms and the laws across the country of China, they have been strengthened. The new espionage, counter-espionage law. Espionage refers to spying activities. So the new counter-espionage law of China, which will uh, get in effect from next month onwards, it is expected to further harshen the conditions under which any person can be charged, any organization can be charged for espionage. For example, let's suppose you are running an organization in China. Let's suppose you are running a company A. Now, if that company is found to have any documents dealing with the national data pointers and data records of China, it will be taken at the same level as if you are stealing the state secrets or the national secrets. 
it will be akin similar to treason. So imagine the number of people who can be persecuted, the number of organizations who can be persecuted and all these are basically giving uncertainty especially the policy uncertainties in the coming years and that is never going to be good for the global trade and the global economy. Now the possible impact of this. What are the possible impacts? First of all, China over a period of time will be reducing dependencies from the United States. As a result of that, trade volume decreases. When the trade volume decreases, it has got its own cascading impact on global economy. The world starts looking inwards by taking a look at the examples. For example, think about it. If United States tomorrow bans the aspect of any Chinese involvement in the chip manufacturing or semiconductor industries, many of the US allies, they will follow suit. So the international trade will come down and the economies will turn protectionist. When the economies, they turn protectionist, global GDP falls down and for a country like India, which is relying on increasing the exports to achieve the economic growth, that is a very bad news. Global supply chains, they are hit. We have observed during the COVID pandemic that any discrepancy or any hiccup which exists in the manufacturing process anywhere in the world, the world is so very well connected now that the overall product delivery is impacted maybe tens of thousands of kilometers away. For example, take the case of automobile industry. The reason automobile sector in India has not been growing at the required rate for the past couple of years is because there is a significant dearth of semiconductor chips. They are not being manufactured enough. Now, as the various countries, they turn protective and protectionist rather than uh, adhering to the norms of globalization, you will come across many more such events. And as a result of that, you will have the economic impact critical technologies and their availability that will be much more difficult and developing and underdeveloped nations they will be hit the maximum because of this and that provides scope for emerging economies this is where the shining light exists for countries like India we will have more scope to enter into these markets and to fill the vacancies created in the global supply chain because for large democracies like India India as a source as a partner as a manufacturing base will be much more acceptable to many countries both in ideological and economic scale as compared to China so in this article what is it that you need to analyze why this is happening, the larger trend behind it, so that you are able to foresee that what is it that, uh, going to emerge into, into the coming days, into the coming future. Secondly, you need to understand that this will have an impact on the global economy, global supply chain. How? Thirdly, you need to see the dichotomy in international relations, what China is pursuing as its own national policy of developmental security aspect, marrying them together and how it is preaching India to do the exact opposite of it due to which the border dispute that is raging on across the northern borders of the country as of now it is very hard to resolve and then eventually the scope for emerging technologies and emerging economies like India into the going future okay now after this we move on to a couple of topics which we'll cover in very brief that will be relevant for your prelims perspective. So the announcement was made that Gita Press Gorakhpur has been awarded the Gandhi Peace Prize for 2021. Now Gandhi Peace Prize is as prestigious as an award as it can get and the previous recipients have been very very well known and eminent personalities. Now here for your prelims, what do you need to understand? First of all, what is this Gita Press Gorakhpur? It is a publishing house to be in very brief and it generates a lot of these publications and overall it has published around 41.7 crore books in 14 languages including 16.2 crore copies of the Bhagavad Gita itself. So that is where Gita Press has been a known name for a long time. Now, who selects this? Which is the jury responsible for selecting or nominating anyone for the Gandhi Peace Prize? So, the jury comprises of Prime Minister of India, Chief Justice of India, 
leader of the single largest opposition party in Lok Sabha and two eminent members. Now, the term of the jury is three years. All of this is, by the way, relevant for your prelims. Okay? Now, here, please understand that PM, CJI and the leader of the single largest party in opposition in Lok Sabha, they are the permanent members. They are ex-officio members because just by being at that post, they are eligible to be the members of that jury. Whereas the eminent members, they retire. That is, these two eminent members, they keep on retiring. And reappointment can be done. PM is the head of the jury, right? And a majority is required to make a decision. So from here, a multi-statement question can easily be framed. And overall, it is an annual prize. The Gandhi Prize is an annual prize instituted in 1995 to mark the 125th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. The few prominent organizations who have received the award, basically ISRO, Ramakrishna Mission, Grameen Bank of Bangladesh, Sulab International, to name a few. UPSC has asked a question in the prelims from this particular aspect and the question was as direct as who has been awarded the Gandhi Peace Prize and that is where you had the various different options. And famous individuals if you will observe from Nelson Mandela to Archbishop Desmond Tutu to Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. So global luminaries have also been given this award. So if a statement is framed that this award is only for the national or the citizens of the country that will be an incorrect statement. Then moving on to the last topic. And that is a topic which basically tells us a trend. A trend which is not very important to learn, but the crux of it is important to be understood. That is net direct tax collection rises 11.2% to rupees 3.8 lakh crore. Now here, while the uh, tax collection has increased, we need to look at the aspect of direct taxes. So taxes in general are classified into direct and indirect taxes. Now in the case of direct taxes, as an individual, the tax is levied directly upon you and you end up paying directly to the government, right? Whereas when we talk about indirect taxes, for example, GST, customs, or rather GST, sales tax, customs duty, etc. Now these particular indirect taxes, when you buy something, when you ship something out to somewhere, it is in those cases that a charge is levied or a tax is levied and that is indirect. If you don't buy it, a product from the market, GST will not be levied from you. But when we say direct tax, for example, you are earning something, income tax, it will be a direct tax. So you need to understand the difference. So corporate tax, income tax, wealth tax, gift tax, securities transaction, capital gains tax, long term capital gains, etc. All of them, they come under the category of direct tax. It is handled by CBDT, that is the Central Board of Direct Taxes, whereas indirect taxes are handled by CBITC, that is, or CBIC, that is Central Board of Indirect Tax and Customs. Okay? So this is something you should be aware of. Okay? Kishan in jury, the leader of opposition of Lok Sabha is required. Okay? Now, then the questions which can be framed from here. Discuss the trends observed in the cyclonic disturbances across the northern Indian Ocean and analyze the reasons behind the same. Now here we have a 10 marker question. So here when you are writing the answer, the introduction should be very brief around 25 to 30 words. So what do you write in the introduction of this? So in the introduction, you simply talk about the generalistic behavior of the northern Indian Ocean. That northern Indian Ocean being surrounded by land areas gets heated up quite frequently due to which the cyclonic events are very very common. Now various reasons can be ascribed to their formation of these cyclonic events. That will be your introduction sufficient. Then in the body portion here you talk about that these cyclonic disturbances what are the months when you observe these disturbances across the northern Indian Ocean? Typically April to June and then again October to December. That is the cyclonic season in the northern Indian Ocean. Now over a period of time, the trends observed is, and you talk about the three trends. And which are the trends? That the number of cyclonic disturbances has 
been increasing more amount of cyclonic disturbances in Arabian Sea still Bay of Bengal has got greater amount of these disturbances but that number is dipping why that is happening you can talk about it you can talk about the uh, feature of recurring El Nino positive Indian Ocean dipole how that is initiating or helping the cyclonic disturbance in Arabian Sea and also the intensity of cyclones is ever increasing why because now the heating is happening at an incredible pace due to which the low pressure develop is very, very intense, which attracts the winds, causes the issue. Then, eventually, uh, when you are trying to conclude the answer, simply talk about that for the greater frequency of these cyclones, we need better prediction models in order to reduce the loss and damages caused because of these cyclonic storms. Okay? And then... What is the concept of common but differentiated responsibility? Discuss the challenges faced by developing world in adapting to the climate change. So here in the introduction part itself, address the first portion. So CBDR should be addressed in the introduction part itself. What do we mean by it? Right, where the developed nations have a greater onus, a greater share of responsibility. And then in the body aspect, talk about it, the various issues that why funding is not available, why loss and damage is still not being treated as it should be, technology is not available, all those aspects you can talk about and that will be the answer. Okay, so that is basically all that is required for the newspaper of today. Try writing these answers, take up the test on the Telegram channel and that will be all from my side. If you have liked the session, if you have liked the content, please don't forget to click on the like, share and the subscribe button. See you again tomorrow. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Thank you.